welcome to Jenny's Paleontology Lesson and welcome to another video. So, this video, as you can see from the title of it, is the last part of this entire speech that I gave about this amazing summer program called Stones and Bones at one of my paleontology classes at my high school. So, let's get into the video. Um, what did we find on this trip? So, we found some more regular finds like Nydia, Priscocaris, Coprolites, and Diplomistus. Um, we also found some of the rarer finds like Theriotis, Myoclosis, or Nodos. I think we actually found baby fish of the second two, but I might be wrong because we did find a lot of things on this trip. And then most impressively, we found a gar skull. So this is what a gar skull would look like. So we actually found this pretty much by the end of the trip, which means that we didn't have enough time to fully extract it. And we thought that the body of the gar um, really extended into the rock formation behind us. So it would take a lot of time for us to expose that. But it was nevertheless a very cool find. A fun story about that is that we actually first thought it was an alligator skull and we got all really excited. But I think we did some x-raying on the spot and then we found it was a gar skull, which does not take away from how amazing that find is because gars are still really rare, um, a really rare find in the FBM formation. We also found some cool plant life like Tree of Heaven Seeds, we found an abundance of those and some partial palm fronds. Um, one cool thing about plant fossils is that you can only find them purely by luck um, because instead of like, you know, animals with like vertebrae, um, there are no like bulges in the rock that can indicate that there is a fossil there. So you're literally just splitting out the fossil, you're just splitting the layers and hoping there's something in there because the plants actually are preserved as just a thin, like fine carbon dust. So you also have to be really careful when you encounter them so that you don't smudge it because that would be damaging the fossil itself. And we also found some partial shells of turtles and some fly fossils. So if you see here, like the red circles, in those red circles are like little flies preserved. They must have like fallen into the lake and then just got preserved there. So how we prepared these fossils. So after we got back to the museum after those two weeks, we got to choose exactly what we want to pre uh, prepare ourselves. And I cho chose like a partial skeleton of the skull of a large diplomistus. I can go back to that slide where I showed the diplomistus, um, but it was a really cool fish. Anyway, so we first prepared them with pin vise, just scratching away at the matrix around the bone, um, of course under a microscope. And this is really cool because I remember the exact wording was you have to make it as though the fish was floating on the matrix. So you don't want to dig in too deep, but you also don't want to just expose the bare minimum of the bone. So that was <laughs> that took a lot of practice. We also used sand blasters whose name can be a little bit misleading because it actually blasted out like a sort of particle called dolomite, which is a little bit harder than the matrix surrounding the fossil, but then um, a little bit softer than the fossil itself, so it wouldn't severely damage the fossil. But this process also has to be done um, under the microscope. So how it worked is that it would shoot out like a pressurized airstream and you would sort of aim and angle it at the fossil itself and then just expose the fossil bit by bit. So that's the conclusion. Um, it's really hard to conclude this experience just because of like the sheer amount of joy that I had within this experience. I met so many amazing people and like that it was like students and teachers and mentors and staff in the museum, just so many different people. And then I think if there is one thing that I want all of y'all to take away from this is that I really want to encourage all of you to seek out these new opportunities. So especially if you find yourself to be, you know, even merely like a little bit intrigued by paleontology, still seek out these opportunities because this is how you can really tell if you are interested in the paleontology or if you're interested in something else that is sort of surrounding this field, which is all okay experiences, but it's just really cool to go out there and meet a group of people who are also passionate about the same things that you're passionate about. I think, um, like personally, it's a really empowering experience. So by seeking out new opportunities, it could be like volunteering at the Elf Museum or just going on summer programs, even though that doesn't have to be as far as Chicago. Um, before I end this talk, I want to give out some acknowledgments. So first of all, I really want to thank the people 
who are not here but made this trip possible, like Dr. Grand, Kiko, Jim, Drew, Adrian, Brian, Tony, and so many other people who worked within the University of Chicago and the Field Museum who made this trip reality because it was just such an amazing experience. I want to thank Dr. Farkey Let's for Let's go! <laughs> today and that concludes the speech that I gave about this amazing summer program called Stones and Bones at my high school. So again, the reason why I wanted to do this video and wanted to do that presentation that I did in the first place is because I really want more people to learn about great opportunities related to paleontology that people like me or students can do during their summers. So if you have any other ideas about other possible summer programs or just other opportunities related to paleontology in general, feel free to add something in the comment section below and see you next time.